नमस्कार एवरीबॉडी एंड वेलकम टू दिस एपिसोड ऑफ मंथ वी कंटिन्यूइंग एंड एंड होपफुली रैपिंग अप व्हाट इज आवर आवर सीरीज सो इफ यू सीन द पास्ट एपिसोड्स एंड आई वेलकम यू टू चेक इट आउट ऑन आवर YouTube चैनल um or we also have an audio feed uh, you know for these episodes uh, where you can see that we've reviewed uh, you know agriculture allocations we've reviewed the allocations from a healthcare perspective especially since healthcare was you know had one of the biggest um, uh, you know or one of the most noted allocations in probably a very very long time for india uh, we've also looked at it from a defense perspective which is always very important um and then our last episode was uh you know regarding msme and the business uh, you know area of area uh, of of the budget allocations so today what we're going to do is we're going to sit with uh, the person who's been doing all the interviews but also uh, someone who is, will hopefully give us a more accounting perspective of the budget and i think that's something that we should discuss uh, you know because it's uh, accounting tends to be the thing that nobody talks about everybody talks about the very exciting allocation that went here and the fun allocation that went there or not enough came to this industry uh, you know but we also need to talk a little bit about uh, you know the accounting uh, angle of of everything as well so welcome dada and uh, um, as you've been asking everybody uh, how would you rate the budget uh, overall uh, you know on a scale of 1 to 10 well i think uh, i am a little biased right now after having talked to so many experts so i would uh, possibly be fearful of contradicting any of them uh, but in my opinion i think it is it should be 8 uh, out of 10 overall yeah and i think that's uh, if if that's all just about the average of what i think all all the uh, panelists told us in terms of the overall rating of the budget yeah. um so now the the specific question right let's talk about the accounting perspective and from an accounting perspective which includes things like the fiscal prudence and the deficit and all the targets uh, you know how would you rate the budget do you feel like there's been sort of a lean towards uh, not necessarily populism but is there been a lean towards over allocation and then the bigger announcements Uh, you know as compared to what the revenue targets are and things like that how would you rate that side of the budget um i i look at it slightly differently you know like uh, <clears throat> most of the allocations have been done based on certain assumptions and certain projections uh, and and given that the uh, different ministries which get the allocations they must have done their homework very well to seek that kind of an allocation or perhaps uh, there has been a slight rationalization over the figures that they would have actually wanted to have so uh, the allocation itself is not uh, not very questionable it, it, on firm grounds those allocations have been made the real issue that has been observed for the last so many years is that while we have an allocation the common man uh, i mean you and me do not get to know how that allocation has actually been utilized by the various ministries what portion of it what percentage of it remained unutilized and what would have been the impact or what is likely going to be the impact if the utilization is not complete because when the allocation is made it is made with the understanding that this will be fully utilized so on full utilization and uh, an estimated outcome is projected that well after this i will have 10000 kilometers of road but if the allocation is not completely utilized do i fall short and uh, and 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 stay complacent that i have done 9800 kilometers i have not been able to do 200 kilometers because i i did not have time there were no manpower there were no equipments or whatever so that definitely is uh, an area where the budget needs to look at i i think the government needs to tell us either at the survey level or at the budget level or even at the finance bill level what were the shortfall in reaching the allocation 100% in the previous year what were the reasons and what were the impact on the so called projects or the areas of development for which those allocations were made for example if 
there's been a 4,000 crore allocation for minorities, and there is a shortfall of, I mean, in achievement by say 300 crores, then, then the, the, everybody needs to know or has a right to know why, what would have happened had these 300 crores been also utilized at the right time. Would it have made life of 20 more citizens better? Something like that. I mean, some measurable outcome must be correlated to the allocation that has been made, which I think this budget or any previous budget has not done. So something something of that sort. So it's it's one thing of that with this budgeting needs to do do uh, uh, a rear view analysis of the performance. Besides that, uh, also we have to understand that if there has been an allocation and it has not been achieved, a hundred percent utilization has not been achieved. Then where is the sense of having a certain amount of deficit? as an assumed deficit after the fiscal year. If underutilization is a natural, uh, natural uh, uh, performance of the government, then that, that, that characteristic underutilization must be factored into the allocation itself so that there is a lesser deficit. So that is what I think is uh, overall what I could uh, feel about. Otherwise, uh, there have been very fair allocations, some schemes uh, like healthcare and all people have been having some issue with the uh, quantum of allocation that has been made. But then uh, this scheme itself has not yet been uh, totally uh, uh, worked out, I would say. So I think by October, the real workout of the, uh, the projections come and then uh, the the kind of responsibilities that the center versus the state would be decided, and perhaps the source of funds would also be um, more clearly articulated by the respective governments. So, uh, I am not uh, uh, unhappy about uh, the uh, allocation for healthcare. Another uh, aspect that uh, I think uh, that that we have been overlooking for quite some time is that when we talk of a deficit, what impact does it have on the economy, on the uh, treasury, and on the general life standard of the people? The standard of life of the people, how it gets affected by deficit? Is it, uh, is it something that's going to affect them in future? is a deficit, uh, is something uh, that the government does today to make my life worse tomorrow, is something that needs to be fully addressed. So for, for the benefit of people who are listening, uh, there are a couple of things that I want to sort of uh, point out in addition to what you were saying, which is, you know, one of the, one of the potential, I mean, or rather, there are many reasons why allocations would not be completed, right? Uh, some of it, as you mentioned, yes. some, of, some of it is, is project related issues. So you have issues because time was not enough, manpower wasn't enough, uh, you know, those kind of things can happen. And as a result of which, as you mentioned, to use the example of the roads, uh, you know, say, uh, 200 kilometers didn't didn't finish because the year is over and you know it didn't happen uh, the other angle of this as well is as you mentioned is the center state relationship right uh, so uh, the central government announces a scheme that is a state subject but it's you know the central funding and the healthcare is a good example of this uh, here it, it, you know all the state governments uh, individually need to sort of you know get on top of it identify i mean of course again with the relation to the healthcare scheme these are some of the details will be worked out but once the criteria are established as to you know who would be eligible for the scheme uh, you know it's it's on to then the state for them to come up with their list of allocations and actually assign them and, and do this job right so there, there are those there are those angles to it as well and then as you mentioned there's also interdepartment angles as well right so what we are talking about budget is from a from a ministry of finance perspective to say this is the allocation that they're going to do based on what the ministry comes to them and tells them that they expect or want or whatever. And then sometimes it's also with relationship to the uh, general direction the government wants to take for the year. So if the government wants to do a healthcare push for the year, I mean, with or without, uh, you know, the ministry explicitly asking for something like that, 
you know, they may divert funds towards healthcare and which might come at a cost of something else. And we want to talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, so, so these are different areas due to which this is quite a complex exercise. And then of course, the, the, you know, the size of the country we have and the number of states and all this stuff, uh, you know, does make this uh, quite a complicated exercise without any doubt. Um, talking about your rear view analysis, I think it's very interesting because a lot of times, uh, in, in fact, in most budgets, right, what you hear from, from the government, what you hear from the ministries, they talk about allocations. Sometimes they compare the allocations to last year. Um, you know, they, when you think of it like a company, you know, and most of the times they announce comparisons to last year when the allocation has increased. So it, it's more about last year we gave this much, guess what, we're giving out more this year, right? But then when, when, there is, when that doesn't happen, a and and B, which is to the point you raise, which is, yeah, but what happened to that allocation? You are, you allocated ten percent more this year, but does that really mean that last year's actual allocation was used first of all? And if it wasn't, uh, you know, how does you know allocating or allocating ten percent more? It looks good, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's going to be beneficial because you haven't been able to achieve targets. So I think this review analysis has uh, you know huge context for for us, and it's very important for us to understand. Uh, you know, not just maybe last year, but to look at, for, for example, allocations over five years and you know, how much of that, uh, you know, has been done. Um, is a lot of this data really available easily or not so much? No, no, I think data uh, is, is, is finding data is really a pain for a normal person like me. I am not uh, uh, privy to uh, the databases that are generally available to the analysts and the uh, planners. Uh, so it becomes very difficult to really correlate and uh, pinpoint the issues that are reflected by the data. So uh, even the uh, open data initiative of the government, uh, I have been trying to find data, but then uh, all that I could find for budget is up to 2012-2013. Beyond that, data is not available there. So uh, either it's not been updated or it's not made available to public, uh, even if it has been updated. So data is a major challenge and not being able to access data prevents from participating in the budget process proactively and constructively. That is something which I would like to highlight. Okay, so let's get into some of the, or let's delve a little bit into some of the details, uh, you know, regarding this. So obviously, uh, as is the case would be with any budget, we have to look at sort of two sides to the story. Uh, you know, the one side is the expenditure and what the government intends to do. And we've talked about some of this stuff, which is the allocation and everything else. And the other side is the revenue. Uh, so, so we've already been touching about a little bit about expenditure. So just to put something in perspective, um, we are roughly looking at, uh, uh, I want to read this number properly. Uh, you know, it's about 2.4 million crore, roughly. Uh, so, I mean, if we have a, I mean, as as a, as a central government of India, we have an extremely large expenditure model, right? Uh, and that's natural because we have uh, tremendous outlays that will be done. I mean, something even even something as simple as as national highways, which is the responsibility of the central government, therefore allocation has to be done. Uh, you know, we talked about sort of this tremendous five lakh crore. Um, requirement that uh, that you know they're looking to fulfill in healthcare and things like that. Now, what is the impact of these schemes when we're looking at, so we have to talk a little bit about the revenue as well, and the revenue has been going up because we've had sort of changes in tax compliance and all of these things. But what is the immediate impact? Because what the government has been doing, at least for the last four years, is to try and adhere to a very, very tight fiscal discipline. And when I say that, what I mean to say is that they are trying to bring down uh, the fiscal deficit of the central government over the course of years, gradually by, by a couple of percent, I mean, a 0.1, 0.2 percentage points kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're steadily doing so. So again, for, as an example, for the last financial year, uh, you know, the final fiscal deficit uh, came to roughly about 3.5%. Uh, and so the government has this year decided that, you know, we're going to target uh, bringing it down for the next year to 3.3%. So, you know, uh, 0.2 percentage points. Uh, improvement in, in fiscal uh, deficit. So, a as, as you as you started to ask the question is what does that really mean you know for for us um, as citizens or what does it mean for us when it, when we're talking about you know what the government is doing for us and why that's important for us as a country but then also you know when you have such tremendous uh, new allocations that are coming out I mean one of the things that hit us um, not last year but the year before was the OROP allocation which was not budgeted for and things like that and then you have something you know as tremendous as, as this allocation is for healthcare um, you know 
how does the government try to you know sort of manage this bit where it's trying to bring down its deficit constantly but then there's such a high uptake in its expenditure as well because it's the allocation to healthcare last year to this year i mean the percentage will, will be crazy so it won't be it's not a small increase uh, well uh, let's try to understand one thing i mean let's not talk about a government it's a, it's a very big uh, uh, very big uh, entity and the <clears throat> mammoth size of the government itself and its expenditure and revenue may be difficult to fathom by our normal standards let's try to understand it from a personal uh, income and expenditure point of view uh, if the government does not increase the allocations the necessary uh, spurt in employment and other productive economic activity will not happen so it is very important that there are larger and larger allocations for infrastructure for uh, health care for defense for anything that brings more economic productive economic activity that is very important and when that happens when employment increases the consumption character and the consumption capability of the people also increases accordingly because there is more employment there is a more greater consumption there is a greater revenue for the government so the the balancing act that the government has to do is to see how much of uh, spending will generate how much of larger revenues so that the gap closes down so uh, the so when it comes to expenditure there could be an expenditure which is an investment into the infrastructure or something new coming up some uh, productive activity or it could be an expenditure on the maintenance of the government itself so the only space where they get some leeway to reduce is the expenditure of the government for governance but there should not be any compromise on the allocation for development projects when you talk of reducing the expenditure for governance the major effort that has been seen in the recent times is by digitalizing most of the uh, processes so that there is higher efficiency and higher uh, revenue uh, per person generated in the uh, revenue side so this is uh, typically how anybody would be managing and that's how the government is also managing the only change in how there is that the non plan expenditure that we see most of the times uh, that has remained uh, a little volatile for the last 2 3 years and that i think though it's very small in numbers but i don't think that's going to affect very majorly but yes a uh, larger allocation of plan expenditure is a must for the country to develop further and reduction in cost of maintaining the government must be ensured so uh, let's talk now a little bit about the the revenue side of things so uh, one of the things that uh, has been constantly actually on the rise and uh, you know there are, there are a couple of angles to this uh, mostly tax related ones uh, one of the big things that's been going on especially over the last couple of years but sort of a little bit longer than that as well um, is sort of uh, you know increasing the tax base as we call it so one of the big concerns one of the big issues um, as has been uh, you know uh, talked about for for many many years um, but something that was raised as well in in the finance minister speech not this year but last year uh, you know where he talks about you know what we have as tax compliant citizens is a very very small percentage of what it is expected to be right or what is it is projected to be whether or not it is actually true is is, is a matter of uh, uh, seeing how it goes so um just just to put again number here so in in the previous financial year so financial year 15 16 um, you know the total number of tax payers was about 60.47 million and this has now jumped to about 80.27 million so about 20 million new tax payers were added in in just one financial year which is a d- decent bit of growth right there 
Um, similarly, we had GST come in uh, in about, uh, you know sometime in, in uh, August last year. And while the allocations under GST meant that the central government might take a little bit of a hit because you have to remember that for the first, I think, three years or maybe it's five years, uh, you know, the central government is doing additional compensations to the state against, you know, all the rejig that's been going on under GST. So that there are issues there. But what GST has also brought about is, again, greater tax compliance. So what used to happen under the radar pre-GST uh, is now starting to increase as well. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the impact of, the, of this stuff as well, because, uh, like I said, it's an issue that has been debated for a very long time. Uh, you know, the issue that we, we hear from the people side of this context is, yes, yes, it's great. I'm more than happy to pay tax, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, at the end of the day, this has to then come back and show us some benefit to the society as well. Right? When we talk about the infrastructure and stuff, which is something that India has typically struggled under. Uh, so let's talk first about like this increase in revenue, what it means to the government. Um, and then are we really, I mean, uh, can, can we say it somewhat reliably that the fact that we've seen such a nice increase in revenue uh, will mean good things for us in three to five years uh, down the road? Uh, look, uh, first of all, let me tell you, uh, I am bugged by only one thing in the taxation system in our country, or for that matter, in in any country where a direct tax and an indirect tax uh, regime runs. I am bugged by the uh, exceptionalism that is practiced by the governments. For example, for income tax, whether it's personal income tax or corporate income tax, there are certain category of people, either by way of their profession or by the vertical in which they work or uh, by virtue of uh, the quantum of their income versus the permissible expenses, etc. And the, by virtue of certain kind of uh, constitution that the companies may be having some people are given an exception and are allowed not to pay tax. This works as a disincentive for anybody who is compelled to pay a tax. So the moment you give somebody a, an alternative that you, if you were doing this, you could possibly be escaping the payment of tax people would be definitely wanting to adopt those methods. So that's why you would see there are trusts coming up and there are NGOs coming up and then there's so many uh, things that are happening in this. Yeah, uh, people declaring but, themselves as farmers because farmers yeah, are exempt and from farmers, tax. Kind of thing, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So that exceptionalism is not the right thing to happen for any taxation uh, structure. As against this, if you look at GST, GST is all inclusive. It does not differentiate whether you are a farmer or you are not a farmer. As an end purchaser of any goods or services, you pay the tax that is built into the goods or services that is being purchased by you. It is built into it, so you cannot escape it. Earlier, also, the sales tax was of a similar kind, but then the implementation was absolutely manual and it had its own inefficiencies because of the manual nature of the taxation. But now that you have been able to digitalize it and possibly uh, going towards uh, making proper processes for ensuring that everything sold is accounted for and against the purchase of that uh, at some other stage of the business cycle, this is the right way to go where there is no exceptionalism. If, if you have to purchase food and I have to purchase food, we pay the same tax, the same rate of tax we pay, irrespective of whether you are a farmer or, and I am a government officer, it doesn't matter. Now that non-exceptionalism is the most important aspect of GST. So I don't grudge. If everybody is paying, I don't grudge. But the moment you tell me that if you were such and such, you would be not paying it, then I grudge. Yeah, and and, and again to to clarify here as well, like the exception that that the GST has that comes with it is purely a turnover based one. 
So if you're under yeah. a certain turnover in your exam, that's yeah. fine. But that doesn't matter yeah. of the type of industry or, or, or the, the business you're in. And similarly, yeah. once you cross that threshold, doesn't matter again what type of industry you are, you are, you are in. And that threshold in practical terms is so small. 20 lakhs is such a small threshold <clears throat> that only very, very small uh, traders and uh, service providers would be exempt. But generally, anybody would be doing a 20 lakh uh, turnover in a year uh, without any doubt. So uh, that also brings me to another uh, aspect of it. You see, in income tax or in a tax where exceptionalism is permitted, it is very difficult to ensure a broadening of tax base by voluntary compliance. It becomes very difficult because people will always try to find ways of escaping it. Whereas in GST, you cannot escape it. And if you look at the current figures that the government is giving, even for mudra loans, if there are 7 crore organizations and people who have been funded, who have been um, lent money to do their business, I think uh, the government can safely uh, assume to reach a tax base of 2 to 3 crores in 3 years time. Because all these mudra beneficiaries, with whatever little effort that they do and with whatever attrition that may happen in the, in the middle, at least 2 to 3 crore people will be succeeding in getting a turnover whereby they become eligible for GST. Now that is the time when the real broadening of the tax base will happen. And we have to actually progressively more and more uh, try to acquire such processes where the tax base increases automatically by compulsory compliance and not by optional compliance. And then again, the, there is a long-term implication to this as well, right? So if the government is able to add a, a significant amount of uh, increased businesses or just general taxpayers, uh, it also it can mean that the government can go a little bit easy on it. So as, as we've seen already, uh, and this, this is what happened this year as well, uh, where we had this sort of increase in, in turnover. Under, so one of, the, one of the announcements that came out this year was that the, the 25% um, fixed corporate tax rate that that has been you know that that is that was in place last year which was a a uh, hundred crore turnover uh, basis so if you have, uh, just to explain that basically if you have a, a turnover of 100 crore you are assumed to pay a fixed ta tax rate of 25 percent right and it's slightly higher if, if it goes more and then this year the same 25 percent has now been increased to turnover of 250 crores so it's more than doubling of the turnover uh, you know to clients so it adds to simplification of process, obviously, when you have a fixed rate and you don't have to sit and compute a lot of these other nitty-gritties that go into it, it makes life easier for compliance. But at the same time, the reason the government can, because to, to do a, uh, the calculation, it actually means that by doing this, the government is actually going to take a hit of about 7,000 crore in, in its revenue generation because it is bringing those companies that were initially paying 28% or, or higher rates of tax uh, to doing it. But the, the the reason they're able to do that is because they they know that it means that more companies will declare themselves more, you know within Absolutely. within the acceptable rate and, you know more companies will be happy to do that because they know that it it means that they are not going to be significantly affected by the tax rate so so there is a sort of while it looks like immediately let's say for example again these are long term things that we need to look at which is you know this year there's going to be a hit of 7000 crore but there's a potential that the year after and the year after that more, you know, adding more companies in. Okay. Uh, so the other thing as well, I wanted to sort of uh, address because I think this was one of the, since we're in the taxation uh, bit as well. Uh, did you have any thoughts regarding this sort of uh, reintroduction of the capital gains tax? Uh, so uh, previously where we had the situation where if you had, uh, you know, short-term capital gains, which were taxed, the long-term were not. And now the, the long-term capital gains are going to be taxed again, uh, which are, did create quite a lot of, uh, you know, as, as usual, as it tends to do with the budget, when, the, you know, a new tax is introduced, uh, it does create a bit of a, I think, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I would simply say, you know, like, uh, this is a perfect example of the kind of exceptionalism that prevailed in the capital goods uh, assets uh, taxation area. Till now, 
long term was not taxable so there was an exception the moment you remove it people start feeling that well this is something which is not not should, should not have been done But the point is, why not have a uniform policy, irrespective of the term for which the investment is there, irrespective of the term? It could be a one-day investment, or it could be a hundred-year investment. The 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 policy for taxation should be uniform for all. So that is where, again, I would say this is a good move in the sense that the disparity between long-term and short-term is. Uh, at least being attempted to be removed in in some sort of way i don't know uh, what other uh, uh, overlapping laws would be there in the taxation uh, manuals which would make somebody pay more or less by virtue of some exception so i don't know that uh, as of now i i am not a tax expert so i can't do that but i definitely feel that the way to go is to actually make uniform taxation policy for all kinds of assets for all kinds of income and for all kinds of expenses so there's i mean one thing so again this is i'm not an economist per se or, or so on but you know just looking at it from a from a trend perspective the one other impact that what i feel when i when i hear about that that tax yeah there is a, the only exception as far as i for the announcement anyways that there's a one like uh Things so it gains about one like uh, what is going to be taxed, uh, not under. Uh, but one of the things that, that that the way it reads to me is it's sort of an interesting way to kind of keep things moving as well. So you keep something for longer. Now it actually has a detriment to you compared to before, right? So yeah. previously you would just sit on the thing, you would sit on your assets at least a minimum of one year because you don't want it to be taxed by. merely but or could be other reasons as well and now suddenly that that sort of philosophy has to change a little bit because now you're going to be forced to sort of start moving the assets around a little bit better faster whatever it might be and again this is very a conceptual statement as so i'm not trying to generalize too much okay, but so where there is potentially a, a help to the economy indirectly as well it would it would definitely i mean one thing is that definitely there would be uh, additional revenue coming out of whatever long term trades that are being done apart from that progressively people would be more realistic in holding or selling their assets based on need rather than based on greed of saving taxes so uh, the economy runs better when it is need based rather than greed based so uh, any any economy would be running better in this kind of a scenario so i i think i fully endorse the government's view so far as ltcg is concerned yeah and and again to put a number the the revenue jump by doing this is expected to be somewhere in the 20000 crore area so it's again it's a pretty significant jump in uh, you know in what they're looking at now no but but again uh, i mean if you look at uh, the kind of uh, flourish that is being seen in the stock markets Uh, and uh, the kind of decline that is being seen in the real estate markets so i do not know uh, end of the day which way the scale will go but definitely i think it will be in the positive the quantum time will tell us excellent uh, is there anything else on the expenditure side and stuff that you want to address uh, that we may not have covered already i think you touched almost everything uh, i think you okay. touched almost everything so but but i would also in, in very short short uh, Uh, time try to uh, highlight what uh, the people that have talked uh, about the budget from defense healthcare agriculture and uh, msme enterprise entrepreneurship there was one common chord that came out and that common chord is the budget is very good invariably everybody rated it 8 of 10 9 of 10 but the ground level implementation of the projects is not as per the desirable standards this is so in case of healthcare this is so in case of defense this is so in case of agriculture in fact agriculture i was uh, i was a little surprised that Uh, the expert 
who is an agricultural economist, very assertively said that the benefits of crop loans are not being passed on to the farmers. The farmers are not even aware. So one of his major complaint about the whole system yeah, the was, bit was something that was very surprising. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it, it is such a good thing, such a good thing that is happening on the ground that, that insurance is being given, whether it's crop insurance or whatever other insurance, but people are not aware that there is an insurance available. If they, even if they are aware, they are not aware about the process to claim it. And even if they are aware of the process, they don't know how to escalate, where to escalate in case the process does not get terminated in its due course. So this is a huge gap. So much of money being spent, so much of expectations having been raised, and then this does not happen on the ground is a major concern. I think this needs to really be uh, taken up by the government in real seriousness. Similarly, about uh, the defense, uh, there was a very, very surprising and, and a very appropriate observation. See, uh, there's been a process of blacklisting companies who have been found to have gone into some kind of you know, uh, lobbying or whatever, bribing and other things. Now, this gentleman says that it may not be a good idea to blacklist them. You may find them or you may do whatever, but do not prevent their products from being used for the safety of the nation. That is something, uh, I mean, they have come to that, that, that company which is producing those equipments has come to that stage because they have quality products. So just don't prevent the usage of quality products just because somebody lobbied or somebody allowed them to lobby or somebody compelled them to lobby. Yeah, now I that think, is I something. something I, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, similarly for the entrepreneurship, again, uh, I think the general complaint was that all this looks very good when you have a threshold value of 250 crores, you get a tax benefit and everything is very good. But at the ground level, how many startups are actually getting the benefit? How many startups are being given the benefits that are, that are appearing as ease of business steps? See, there are a lot of steps that are being taken for doing ease of business. But how much of it actually is percolating to the ground? How much people are able to use it? There is no... Uh, way of monitoring it, supervising it, and uh, I would say uh, to recalibrate the entire uh, pipeline to make it effective. There has to be a concerted effort in all sides about this. Yeah, and I think uh, these are excellent points, raised, honestly, because I think implementation is where the biggest gap is, right? Again, and I, we, we mentioned this at the start of this episode as well, where there are so many other layers in between uh, you know, an allocation that comes from the Ministry of Finance, or okay, if you talk about central government as a whole, to the to the end result, uh, ministries, departments, state governments, their own ministries, and and so much in terms of tiering and and things that happen. But at the end of the day, we have to look at it and we have to study it. We have to figure out better ways to do it. So one of the things, I mean, as an example, you know, when you're looking at implementation of projects, I mean, something this government has done slightly differently um, is that they have these uh, review meetings where project review meetings that happen. I think it's the third Wednesday of every month where uh, the PMO essentially sits with different stakeholders and tries to push projects along, try to resolve issues that might be stalling projects and things like that. But again, you know, we, with the kind of backlog that we have, I mean, these, everything cannot be done by the PMO naturally. Right? And I think that the, see, realist, uh, the, the progress, of, the progress mm -hmm. of projects, I believe, mm -hmm. is more structured and more monitored than the progress of the schemes. See, there are two different concepts. One is a project which has a plan. A scheme has an ambition. It doesn't have a plan. So uh, to make that ambition become real on the ground, there has to be a planning in between which is missing. And when you do a plan, there is always a review. As such, schemes do not have a review. So people also don't get to know 
what is the progress of the scheme how many people uh, got the, their crop loan uh, claims is not known yeah and i think these are again once again valid points i mean again you know we we might talk about uh, this healthcare scheme you know we may we may as as more and more statistics come out in terms of you know what it is that uh, you know will actually determine for example eligibility and, and all of these things see we talk, we are talking about this and that's wonderful right but at the end of the day the person that is actually eligible for this scheme as as and to take the example of the agriculture one needs to be a aware that such a scheme exists and he can do that for his family b he needs to have easy access to uh, you know the psus or whoever it is that will be contacted to deliver this at the end of the day um, and then three and importantly you know when at least when it comes to things like healthcare the claim process and all of this needs to be ironed out because you know at the end of the day when someone is sick when the family members are are, are not well uh, you know having to deal with a process that doesn't go anywhere and stuff is uh, it will just be as bad as as it was before even the allocations right. there and again we go back to the original point that we were making in this episode which is uh, looking at the, uh, the rear view analysis type of thing right so next year just because they allocate to this year they have said okay it will, it will go up, you know 10 crore families i think and 50 crore people is is the number mm-hmm. next year you know they say okay we we did it it worked really well guess what we're going to take it to 75 crore uh, people in total and uh, you know whatever 20 crore families give or take uh, it, this will sound wonderful on paper again because it's going to be like hey look it's it's uh, 10% 20% 50% higher than last year uh, but the important thing again is then to look at that analysis to say listen you know uh, the last year's allocation against which how many families actually signed up got insurance and then use that insurance and then what it needs to be done so these kind of reviews are extremely extremely important i think and that is the central point i guess uh, you know when we're looking at things from an accounting perspective right excellent so uh, if that's uh, was there anything else you wanted to add to this no i i think i am done okay so <laughs> thank you very much ada <laughs> uh, so this uh, pretty much concludes uh, you know uh, for now our our budget review series uh one of the things I, i would like to add here is that we will definitely look i think about 6 months down the road uh where we will try to bring some of these experts back when we you know when we get some ad- additional numbers on allocations and how far these allocations have gone so i think we we get to know that i think uh roughly about 6 months into the year uh so i think we at that point we can at least touch on it and try to look at it you know knowing what we know then compared to the perspective we have now uh but that being said i mean if you like what what you're listening to uh, please do subscribe to our channel as well um so you can be alerted when new videos come out uh we're going to try to do uh you know uh, uh, quite a few episodes every month uh, we're working out a schedule and things like that so um and you can always leave us a comment uh either here or on twitter uh so that we can know what what you think of the episodes what perhaps you might want us to discuss further and we'll keep trying to bring more experts so thank you very much thank you chirag